Amen. We're going to have Sunday school here. If all the adults can move towards the center, amen. All the young people, amen. You're just missed to go downstairs. And uh, on your way to the middle to teach in Bible class here, if you guys will, just shake hands with somebody and tell them you love them. Tell them how good it is to see them in the house of the Lord. And uh, we're going to get started today. I believe God's going to help us uh, and speak to us today. So just moving to the center. And uh, let's enjoy time together. Amen. Today, um, we're going to have Brother Cars come up and teach. But before we do, I want us to pray that God would help us to open our understanding and enlighten our minds. And give us a to uh, touch from the Holy Ghost. Um, very burdened today in the spirit, and I feel like the Lord wants to speak to us. And uh, I was praying today that God would let words that would be fitly spoken like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Gold um, is the representation of purity. Uh, and so we need the spirit of purity to speak into our spirit today. And it needs to be framed in silver, in the miraculous power of God. And so let's pray today that God would speak to us all day long. And I really do feel like God met me in the prayer room this morning. And I uh, feel a, a, a heavy anointing for this day. So let's pray together. Jesus, I love you and I thank you for every visitor that's here. God, as we enter into Bible class, I want us to not take it lightly. Let us mind be open, God. Fariando shikar la monde si vira mota priata se frando mokate. In the name of Romo shihir of Romo siye. Have your way right now, Holy Ghost. Speak to us today. Let a word be spoken in this place right now that would be anointed, that would be transferable to every certain person, God, that would open their ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless. Bear with me while I get my notes together. Praise the Lord. It's been a while since I've been able to teach. Um, if anybody remembers, we're teaching on the fruit of the Spirit. Um, we're teaching on um, the inward heart of a man and the inward person so we're dealing with more of inward holiness more so than outward holiness um, although what is in a, a man and what comes out of him is what defiles him it's not what goes into a man but that which comes out of a man that defiles him so getting purity on the inside is the most important thing because when you're pure on the inside purity flows out of you and we'll, we'll get into that today as we teach on this. You know, we went to the Deaf Conference Friday, and it's totally different, like, because, like, the deaf people are, like, leading the service, and you have an interpreter, and so it, it's totally changed, but it's so neat because it was, like, you got to see the purity of God when you, when people, when you have deaf people and there's not a lot of singing there's not there's people just worshiping God signing all in one and you felt the unity and you felt the Holy Ghost falls it was just amazing amazing feeling amazing thing we saw like four people get the Holy Ghost and, and about four people got baptized in Jesus name there was a Trinitarian there that got baptized in Jesus' name. He, he had only been baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but he got baptized in Jesus' name. This deaf gentleman, and it was beautiful. So I tell you what, God, God's moving. Revival's happening all around us and here. It's not just here, it's happening all around us. So people are getting the Holy Ghost, getting baptized in Jesus' name. That's a good thing. Amen. That's the reason to praise God. Amen, amen. I just want to say that to encourage somebody because some people may think revival is not happening, but it really is. Um, but we're, today we're going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. If you can get uh, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, 
we've been we've been talking about this for a while. Um, I, I've not hurried through this because this stuff is like really important. And so, um, a person who understands what the fruit of the spirit is, the Bible says, "Add to your faith." So faith. The faith is talking about there is just our Acts 2.38 belief. Belief that there's one God. Belief that, that we must be baptized in Jesus' name. Believe we need the Holy Ghost. So that is the faith. That is the faith. There's this between the faith, which is, which is our core belief, and faith as saving faith, which, which you believe in God. Saving faith can, can, can bring you to where you believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, but you still have to have the faith to be saved. And the faith is talking about there is, is our systems of beliefs in how we believe. So the way you believe, your system of belief is very important. So you need to add to that. So once you have experience and believe that there's one God, that there, you must be baptized in Jesus' name, and you need the Holy Ghost evidence by speaking on the tongues, and you've done that and received that, we then need to add to our faith. It says add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. Now, it, knowledge is important because if you don't know how to do something, you can't do it. And just because you have knowledge does not mean you have the ability to do it. So the, you, then have to, you then have to learn how to do the things you have knowledge that you have. So when, when we read about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, you first must know what they are and what they are not. Once you know what they are and what they are not, then you need to learn how to do them. And that's where we have to pray. Um, I put something out on Facebook yesterday. I said, you know, you know, I can stand up here and I'm going to teach you and we'll have pastors and preachers and teachers that will preach and teach to us. But understand, you learning how to do these things is not my job. I, I can give you, um, you know, tips. I can give you advice. But all these things, I can't teach you how to do these things. Your teacher is God, and you have to spend time with God. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of men. It's not the fruit of pastor. It's not the fruit of him. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And so God will teach you how to do these things. You know, when, when the disciples didn't know how to pray, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so if we don't know how to do something, number one, you got to be honest and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, God. I don't know how to be a good husband. I don't know how to love my enemies. I don't know how to treat people right. I don't know how to, you know, be kind when people are being mean to me. And if you can admit that, then, and you can pray about it, and you can open your spirit, then God can teach you how to do that. But we got to be honest, and we can't make excuses for ourselves. Because when you do that, you're never going to grow. So we're, we're going to learn about some of these things. Uh, we learned about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Okay, We learned there's no law against any of these. You can do this as much as you want. God's not going to get mad at you because you love somebody too much. Um, so... But it's from the spirit. Normally when we think about somebody being spiritual, we think of someone who may be used in the gifts or they do great outward exploits. They lay hands on people and they're, and they're healed and all that. And all those are great, but understand those are the gifts of the spirit. Those are not the fruit of the spirit. There is a difference. The true test of spirituality does not lie in whether or not you can lay hands on the sick and they recover. The true test of spirituality is the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said you shall know them by their fruit. So, now, uh, it's interesting because a tree, if, if, you, if there's no fruit on it, unless you're some, like, tree expert and you can look at the leaves and tell what kind of, you know, fruit tree this is, you're not going to know. I don't know what there's between a lemon or an orange or I don't know. I don't know all them. Maybe some of you do. You can look at the leaves and the bark and you can say, oh, that, that's an orange tree or whatever. I can't do that. So I have to actually see the fruit. And then I can be like, okay, I see that that's an orange tree. I know that because there's an orange on it, okay? It's not that I'm, a, I'm like this great, smart person on trees. I just I see the fruit, and that's what it is. So Jesus said, you shall not know my, my, my disciples by their love one to another. 
So if, if love's there, and you know what love is because we've defined it, or joy, or peace, or long-suffering, or if, they, if these things aren't there, then they're not spiritual. And, and I mean, th- and, and, and they can do all these other things, but the fact is, is this is, is, is tells us whether a person is maturing in the faith and becoming spiritual. Amen? Amen. So in chapter 6... It's interesting because, you know, in the Bible, it was written as one letter. So there were not chapter and verses when it was originally written. It was a letter. And so while I understand for, you know, finding verses and, you know, fi- uh, finding things that are important to us, we, we need chapter and verses, we also need to understand that there is, is a context that sometimes, even though it starts a new chapter, the context is still flowing. So even though in Galatians 5, you th- Galatians 6 starts a, a new chapter, it does not start a different context. It actually is a continued story or a continued thought. And so... Sometimes, you know, we, we can rush, we, we can read Galatians 5, and then, we can go on to, um, and then we can go on to Galatians 6, and we think it's a different thought, but it's actually not. It's actually a, a continued, a, a, a continued thought. And I'm going to show you this. Uh, Galatians 6 and 1. But in Galatians 6, it talks about how we can, how... When you want to restore people, and I want you to know restoration is apostolic. If you don't think restoring people is apostolic, you're not reading your Bible. Because because restoration is the whole point God came to the earth. The whole point, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Where was it lost? It was lost in the garden. And when were you lost? You were lost at birth. And so he came to redeem us. If you can give me Galatians 6 and 1, please, up there. So so everything needs to be redeemed. Everything needs to be restored. There are things that, that every single one of us has lost in the church. Some of us don't have the prayer life we used to have. We need a restoration of that. Some of us don't have the worship life we used to have. We need a restoration of that. Okay? It's all about restoring. That when you lose, you don't quit. That when you lose, you don't give up. And so some, some things, the Bible, when, when, when you can look in Peter, when it says, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, you read that whole list, you may lose some things there. You may lose your virtue. You can get it back. You may lose knowledge. If you don't study the word for a while, you don't, you don't, you're not under teaching, then you, you may lose some knowledge, but you can get it back. What you, what, but you, if you lose your faith, you can't get that back on your own because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the only way you can have your faith restored is by preaching and teaching and someone helping you but 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 understand that 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 we we have ways to be restored but it takes special people who have a certain possession of the fruit of the spirit to restore people and and, and so that's why I say this is a continued thought he says brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault you which are what Restore such a one in the spirit of what? Oh, in the spirit of what? Meekness. Why meekness? Because it said considering yourself, thyself. Considering yourself. If you really think about yourself and you're honest with yourself, you'll know you're not perfect. And since you know you're not perfect... And you and you, you and you're patient with yourself, then you should have a meek spirit when somebody else messes up, and you should go to them in a spirit of meekness. 
So if, if number one, one, one thing that can keep you from doing that is if you think you're perfect and you think you're your own savior and you think somehow you have earned your right to salvation. Like somehow you've magically, don't, don't ever make a mistake in sin. John said, if any man says he has not sinned, he is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So we, we must first realize our tendencies. We must first realize our, you know, our weaknesses. And then we can then begin to be meek and mild and kind in restoration of others. And so, so when we look in Galatians, we can see that the, these, these fruit, these attributes of God that we can have in our life of the Spirit are there for us so we can bear them, so then we can share them with others. And so, so we must learn how to, to bear one another's burdens, as he says, um, he says, considering thy, thyself, lest thou also be tempted, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fill, fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think he is something, when he, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So we, we have to understand that, that you know what, any, any of us, any of us at any moment without God's grace being on us can fall. The only thing that's keeping you any of you in the church is God's grace, is on your life. The thing that's keeping me, you know, there's, there's a scripture that says, grace had taught me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace taught me that. Not that judgment didn't teach me that. What it was is when I did mess up and I came back to the house of God, the people loved me. God's grace was there for me. And that goodness led me to repentance. And so then God's grace taught me that when I made a mistake and I sinned and I messed up and I came back to the God and I came back to the altar and I came back to the people of God, they wrapped their loving arms around me. They were meek to me. They were kind to me. And that grace taught me it's better to do right. It's better to do right and do it, do what God wants than it is to be out there. Grace taught me that. That when, when you show me grace and you show me grace and you show me grace, it teaches me, man, I don't want to do that again because it hurts. It only hurts me, it hurts my family, it hurts my, my friends, the people I love. And that's what, that's what grace teaches us. And so when you extend grace to people, you're teaching them, you know what? It's better to deny ungodliness. We'll, we'll be there for you, but understand, you're going to suffer. And that's what sin causes. It causes suffering in your life and the lives of others. But grace will teach you that, you know what, hey, I don't, have to, I don't have to be shamed. I don't have to live that way. I can live a better life. And through grace, we know that we can be strengthened through, through love and through people loving us and forgiving us and, 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 and being meek with us and helping restore us. Because restoration is what this is all about. Amen. I haven't even gotten to all my notes. But I just felt this was so important. Sorry about that. Um, one thing to remember in that is that we don't want to lose context because context will flow through a chapter and into another chapter. So and when, when, when you're studying the Bible, make sure you keep everything in context. There's historical context. There's cultural context. All this will help you to understand what the Bible is saying. So after, after he lists the fruit of the Spirit, he immediately goes into, goes into restoration of people. Souls depend on us learning how to master these attributes. 
There's people in your family that are backslid. There's people in your family that are, are, are discouraged. There's people in your family that the devil has deceived. It's not that they're necessarily bad people. You know, Absalom led a whole bunch of people wrong. They weren't bad people. The Bible says they weren't bad people. But simply they were deceived. And there's many people out there, good people, they're just deceived. Whether it's by the devil, whether it's by false teachers, false preachers. So how are we going to win them? By mastering the fruit of the Spirit. By allowing people to see real fruit. You know, fake fruit looks nice, but it won't do nothing for you. You ever seen it like go in someone's house and there's plastic fruit there? You can't eat that junk. But real fruit has real nutrients. And I want to bear real fruit. Because that's what people are looking for. In the Garden of Eden, Eve saw the fruit. Okay, it looked good. Now, that was bad fruit. But it was still what drew her to that tree. So we need to make sure we have good fruit. So when people see it, they're like, man, I want that. I want love. I want joy. I want peace. Amen. So true spirituality has everything to do with people and how we affect them. So it's not a coincidence that Hebrews 6 continues a thought of what, of what um, I'm sorry, uh, Galatians 6 continues a thought of what Galatians 5 is talking about. To get a better understanding, we're going to go to Hebrews 5, 13 through 14. It says, uh, for Hebrews 5, 13 through 14, if you can get that for me. There we go. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Go ahead. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to those who by reason of use have have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So when you're unskillful in the word, that means you don't know how to use the word to, to, to restore people. You know, sometimes we, 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 can, we can have the right purpose, but we don't have the knowledge or the ability to do what we want to do. And that, and that comes with skill. That comes with using it and, and experience uh, of using the word to, to help people, to, to um, edify people. And, that, and that's what this is really all about is edifying people, is, is helping people to, to be restored to God, whether it's, it's a backslider, whether it's somebody that's never known the gospel, um, or somebody who, who, who may be in the church and, or, and really isn't doing everything that, that, that they need to do. It's all about edifying them and helping them. So when, when we, we're, this word we're going to talk about is goodness. Now, this word is interesting because good, this word comes from a Greek word, which is the Greek word agathosune. Now, if it says uprightness of heart and life, goodness and kindness. What's important in here is uprightness of heart. You see that? So there, there's actually two words in the New Testament for good. There's another word, which we're not going to get into right now. But this word is actually talking about you, you, the intent. In other words, your heart. What is your heart desiring? What are you trying to do? You, you may have a good intent. You understand what I'm saying? But you understand that, that your intent is what God looks at. He looks at the thoughts and intents of the what? Of the heart. So intentions are important. And this is the goodness is talking about here. Is that you get that you have goodness in your heart. Your purpose, your intent is right. Now, you may not have all the knowledge when, it, when, a, when a person's new in church and, 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 and you know, they, they want to do right. And, or they've been in church a while and they want to do right. But they don't quite know how to do it yet. But their intent is there. Their desire's there. They're wanting to do the right thing. And so that's the kind of goodness this is talking about. Um, the word has to do with a, a person's 
disposition and their morality. In other words, morality comes from the inside. It's that which comes out of a man that defiles him. So, so we, we have to get the goodness is talking about here is a goodness of intention. We'll talk about actions next week because I'm out of time. But, but understand that, that this is talking about your intent. Like what are you trying to do in your mind, in your heart? Like, like I, I, can, I can do something and, and it may not be perfect. You know what I mean? Like sometimes... Like things at the house, you know, I'll do the best I can, and I'm doing my best job, and it may not be quite as good as what my wife may want it to be, but at least my intent's there. You know what I'm saying? At least I'm doing the best that I can do. You understand what I mean? And so that's what God's looking at. He's saying, are you doing the best that you can do? Now, as you grow, as you learn, and you master different things, and you grow in the kingdom of God, you, you, you should get better. You see what I mean? There should be a maturing, there should be a better ability, a better um, standard for yourself, I guess, is, is what I'm looking at. So this has to do with, with intent, the uprightness of your heart. The goodness here is talking about inwardly. Okay, we'll talk about the actions later but right now, we're just going to be talking about this. Um, I'm out of time, so I have to continue this next week. Sorry I took so long. It's just been a long time since I taught. So anyway, I apologize. I went over a little bit over time. But uh, we'll continue this next week. God bless you. Fruit of the Spirit is extremely important. I know a lot of people that can walk in the gifts, but they have no fruit. And because they have no fruit, they bear no ability for anybody to see that they're actually a child of the king. And uh, Paul said that one problem that the Corinthian church had is they had all kinds of giftings, but they was lacking one of the major fruit of the spirit. They didn't have love. And he said, I don't care if you can do all this stuff. You don't have love. You're just nothing. And he literally said he compared it to maturing He said he compared it to the maturity process. And the, the problem is, is that in the apostolic church, I don't care if I go over a little bit. In, in the apostolic church, we think that people are super mature when they can speak in tongues out loud and go tongues interpretation or give an interpretation or give prophecy. But Paul said that's not maturity at all. The issue of maturity is when you start to show the fruit of the spirit. And that's what brings them a level of maturity. And that's why people will know that you're actually mature. Not that you can have all this power and prophecy and anointing, but that you can actually love people and that you can actually show forth goodness and temperance and meekness. There's something about spiritual maturity that should excite a person because it means that there's growth. Anybody can, anybody can walk in the gifts. Well, I don't agree with that, preacher. Well, then you don't understand the world that's around you. The Bible says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, which means that there's times that you can be acceptable to a gifting and literally operate in that gifting even when you shouldn't be operating that gifting. Samson had a gift called strength. He was an Old Testament gift that was given to him, and the power of his strength operated when he climbed out of bed with a harlot. Because the gift didn't leave him, he walked out, picked up the gates, moved them, put them up on the hill. That didn't mean he was right with God. In fact, he wasn't right with God at all. He was never more right with God than in the middle of his spiritual maturity. And that was when he was judging. He was, <laughs> he was called to lead the people of God out of the Philistine power and clutch. But he could do that just as much through judging the people of God as he could through walking around beating people up. Mm, I got quiet. Amen. I'm not going to go into all that. It's so good to have everybody here today. We're going to dismiss this class in prayer, go into praise and worship, and then, amen, we have second half. But before we do, we're going to pray and ask God to help us. I know our young people are coming upstairs, and 
and uh, we're going to do that. We want our visitors to feel at home. If you've not checked into the Welcome Center visitor, make sure you check in the Welcome Center. We've got gift baskets and stuff we want to give you, and uh, we're excited that you're here today. Let's give all of our visitors a round of applause. So glad you're here. Amen. If we will stand, let's pray together. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for Bible class today. I'm asking you to help us to get a better understanding of your word. I'm asking you to give us the power and the glory that we would have, Lord, to get a hold of what God is calling us to be, that we would be more than sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, that we'd be more than just some random star floating around in the night, but that we would be grounded in the word of God and that we would be rooted in the power of that word. I'm asking you to have your way in every single person that's here today, God. As we walk into praise and worship, let us be ready to receive what the word of the Spirit of the Lord is wanting to speak into this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. 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 Let's love one another. Amen. As we enter in, we got about five minutes here. If you've never been here before, amen. Greet somebody around you and tell them you love them. Amen. No matter whether it's your first time or your one millionth time here, tell somebody you love them before you, amen, get to a place of praise and worship.